oh, it's foundational obedience, Mm -hmm. right? So what we're saying is, if you start your journey of following Jesus with this foundational act of obedience, then just like, quote, making your bed, it's going to set a pattern of your life that you can then follow to success. Welcome to Let's Talk About That, the podcast where we take a deeper dive into Sunday's message and explore any questions you might have. I'm your host, AJ Stevens, joined by lead pastor, Chip Parker, and I'm thrilled to be on this journey with you. Whether you're a longtime member of The Orchard or a first-time visitor, Let's Talk About That is your space to explore, reflect, and connect. Join us as we navigate the intricacies of faith, spirituality, and daily life, seeking to understand how the wisdom shared on Sundays can be applied to our modern challenges. So grab a cup of coffee, find a comfortable space, and let's dive in together. This is Let's Talk About That, where the conversation about Sunday's message never stops. Man, I missed you last week, but but I heard phenomenal things from your podcast with Matt and got to listen to some of that, and it was really good. Is the truth that Matt is so handsome that he draws a crowd through a podcast? Yes. <laughs> Matt's, got, <laughs> Matt's got the voice. Matt's got the face. Matt's got it all. Matt is carrying the the aesthetics of our of our staff, and we love to see it. Shout out, Matt. Shout out, Pastor Matt. Um, but I did hear really good stuff about last week, and so it was a good conversation. Yeah, I got some texts and got to see some shares on Facebook, which is good. We always love mind share, right? Which is why we tell you guys to share this every week. Yeah, it really kind of helps us. You know, not we're not monetizing this. Like we're not. That, that's not why we say share it. But it just, you know, we want people to think about the orchard when they're thinking about giving church a try. End yep. of the day, you Absolutely. know, um, because there are a lot of churches out there that people are connected to because, you know, it's where grandma went or I used to go to vacation Bible school there. And, you know, maybe they're not sure they fit in at that church, how welcome they'd be at that church. And and, and by the way, I would say I think more, most churches are far more welcoming than they get credit for. So I'm not sure they sure. wouldn't be welcome. But at the end of the day, we want to make sure that there are churches out there for people who are not currently going to church, you know. Yeah. And so that's why we want these conversations out there so people can kind of get a feel of who we are, what we think, what we believe. Um, And when they start thinking about church, you know, whether it's a change in their life, uh, tragedy, uh, just a a crisis point, whatever, that they're like, hey, remember that church, you know, Mm -hmm. remember that one. And so, you know, it is important. So anytime you like, share, get it out there, whether it be a share of the podcast or a share of from the message that you heard on Sunday or whatever, it really does make a bigger impact with the people around you than you realize. Yeah, and I, and obviously you're coming and you're listening because you don't hate it. So um, share the product because well, you feel pressured. Yeah, but do you <laughs> at a place like maybe not, I mean maybe at some churches, but I feel like we are like the least amount of pressure applied um, in not regard us. to church life. Yes, yeah. But- Maybe your significant other likes coming. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Touche, touche. Um, so if that's true and you like, you're like, hey, I like this product or I like these people or I like this church, whatever, then why not share it, right? I think one of, the, one of the things that's been uh, abundantly clear to me over the last um, six to eight months, 12 months, whatever, is the power of just saying, hey, this has been impactful for me. What if you came were a part of this too? And then that working, like, you know, we talk about this all stage. The stage push isn't the thing that does it for people. It's the personal shoulder taps. You know, people are always like, well, why don't, why don't you, you know, announce it from stage more? And the truth is the reason why we don't announce a ton from stage is because you're not listening. <laughs> and what people actually listen to are when you tell them, hey, yeah. have you ever thought about doing a life group? Me and my wife are thinking about doing a life group. You guys want to join one together? You know, hey, are you going to this event? I think we're going to this event, you know. So it's not that we don't do stage pushes, but like, to be honest, all that's like group text, you know, like, hey, somebody's going to answer it. It's for somebody. It's not for me. Yeah. It's so funny because we, we talk about group text syndrome all the time. Our small group has like a, uh, a schedule we try to get together for like, who's going to do desserts. And it's, it's that it's, Hey, here's the dessert schedule. Don't be afraid to sign up. And we go look at it a week later and it's still empty because everybody assumes that everybody's already signed up and nobody signed up and <laughs> just happens all the time. hundred percent, hundred percent. So you're right to, to put a point on that. When you share the podcast, when you share the message, when you share quotes from Sunday, uh, a picture from your life group, whatever, it goes so much further than anything we put out as a church. Yeah, 100%. Um, With that said, you know, heard good things, phenomenal week last week, and, you know, it's good to be back. It's good to be back in the saddle. We missed you last week. Um, We we had a foot washing in church Sunday morning. (laughs) I spared somebody then. (laughs) No, we didn't have foot washing. We talked about foot washing. Yeah. um, You know, and, and really the humility side of that and how we're so quick to wash 
the feet of others, but maybe not quick enough to let Jesus wash our feet. And there's still people sitting in our chairs who maybe not have had that moment. I think it was an eye-opening conversation for a lot of people. Uh, to be honest, I haven't had a lot of follow-up conversations with people from that, but just comments that they are having follow-up conversations. Mm. Uh, and, you know, my prayer is that for those who are in the church who may have realized, yeah, I'm not sure I've really ever been saved. Yeah. That it would be that moment for them, yeah. you know, and... I don't believe that we, quote, grow into salvation, that salvation is like a process that we slowly arrive at, you know, uh, in that you're 10% saved, 20% saved, loading, that kind of thing. Right. Um, I believe that there's a moment in time that we go from dead to alive, headed for hell, headed to heaven, lost, saved, whatever. But I do know that in people's life, that is a journey Mm. to get to crossing that line. And there may be people who thought they had crossed that line, but really the journey just took them to the place where you realize for the first time, no, you never did. You you prayed a prayer, right? but you never have known Jesus. Surrendered, and, yeah. And so hopefully there's that moment of humility and brokenness before Jesus where people are like, hey, I need you to do for me what I could never do for myself. Yeah. I'm tired of pretending that I could to myself or anybody else. And so, you yeah, know, that was kind of the point of last week. I think it was good. Um you know, saw some good feedback too. So hopefully it was helpful, but glad you're back on the podcast this week. I'm back. And, um, we, I mean, I think I saw it in the show notes. You, you guys talked about this. Or... Yeah. We just been chilling, just, just uh, out. kicking our feet up and not yeah. listening to Taking any, lots of naps. Crying. Oh yeah. Lots of naps. Lots of naps. Mostly because we don't sleep at night. So we need to nap where we get. <laughs> how many, how many uh, diapers have you gone through? Um, a lot, but you know what? People have been asking us like, Hey, can we bring you diapers wipes? And somehow my wife has like, she's like, tell them no, tell them like, we don't have another square inch of space for wipes and diapers in our house and um so i appreciate everybody who's asked like can we bring you dipes and wipers but we have literally got diapers or wipes and diapers coming out of your dipes dipes and wipers <laughs> wipes and di- i'm not sleep thing. deprived at all that i'm fine dipes and wipers no. i say that jokingly Chris, deucer you're not in the room today but when you listen to this that may be the title of the dipes podcast. and wipers dipes and wipers <laughs> Oh man, but we're it's good. It's been good transition. Um, I was telling you earlier that I think maybe this is the smoothest of the three, and I don't know if that's because she's the most low key or because we have a feel for how it goes at this point, or we just don't care at this point. Yeah, I mean, truly, like uh, there's <laughs> been some of those moments where, like, you know, with the first kid, the, the pacifier drops on the floor, and you're like, oh my gosh, we got to go run it under hot water and get it disinfected, and I'm like, pop that thing in the mouth, suck it off at it, and pop it right back in her. Wait, you know? the, the the baby's mouth, your mouth, Dax's mouth. Yeah, I mean, my mouth. Like, so like that okay, thing okay. hit the floor the other day that the dogs lay on all the time. And I just looked at it and popped it back in my mouth, sucked the dirt off and popped it right back in the baby. And, you know, Checks out. so far, everything's fine. Sounds good. Nothing's, Sounds good. Nothing's hurt. Dirt, but, dirt builds immune systems. Yeah, that's right. So it's been good. Um, Katie's been a trooper. I'm sure she might have a different answer than me in regards to how much well, you getting. Well, she's not on the podcast right yeah. now. You know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, but, you know, perks, you're at home and you timed the birth of this child very well because... It's football season. It's football season. Listen, we were having a conversation in our one of our group chats uh, yesterday or two days one before. One of our. Yeah. That's AJ. We, <laughs> we have a couple. Our. We do have a couple. And uh, one of the comments that was made is my screen time's about to go through the roof. And <laughs> as I, and this is this notification's popping up as I'm looking through my fantasy football app, and I'm like, he's so right, because I got fantasy football, you got college football, you got the trail cam photos that you're looking at every to an unhealthy amount, right? Like, it's just... Yeah, AJ... Well, 100% just like pick up his phone in the middle of a meeting and look at it. And most people would be like, oh, it's a text. No, nope, this time of year, it's a trail kick pick. <laughs> just got buzzed in. Oh, man. But um, it's, it's good. Yeah, you know, it's funny you talk about the screen time thing, though, because yesterday, bad weather. We had to cancel our day. Devastating. We'll, put, we'll talk about that in just a second. But uh, it, that also meant that I usually have baseball practice for the teams I coach on Sunday afternoons, but they were canceled as well. Mm. And it was opening Sunday yeah. of NFL football. And there was a point in time that I had an open book I was reading beside me, my iPad open and looking at something, my phone open and looking at something, and two games on the TV at once. I love it. And I was I'm just here for that. And I was like, Let, <laughs> let's go. The book was my uh, pretending that I was going to do something productive. The phone and the iPad were both fantasy football, yeah. and there were two games. On the the book is like the feel good, like oh, this is fine. This, like this yeah. is justifying the other four like, screens yeah, that are consuming. You know, when, if somebody were to walk in the house to visit, just pull up the book. Oh yeah, just, yeah, read, yeah, just reading. What's that, going on? Crazy. Yeah, yeah. No, I get that. I think um, it is timed well because I get to like I get the luxury of like, hey, Katie. 
go take a nap and I'll just hold the baby while the baby, because usually the baby feeds, right? She'll eat. And then after she's eaten, she's just sleeping. And I think that for new parents, the newborn thing is kind of intimidating. And it's like, really? Let your third one. Yeah. Well, they don't really do anything anyway. I mean, they cry if they're unhappy, but like usually they're unhappy because they have a dirty diaper or they didn't eat um, or maybe option C, whatever that is to your unique situation. But like most of that can be remedied, clean their butt, feed them, and then they're going to be relaxing until they're upset again. And so- here we go. We're That's watching better. football in the meantime. You heard it here first, folks. This is parenting advice with AJ Stevens. <laughs> you guys come on over. We'll uh, bring food with you when you come, but come on over and we'll uh, we'll give you the rundown on that. That's so, great. So uh, circling back to the bad weather Sunday. Yeah, man. devastating. I uh, I did not want to make that call. Yeah, I was phone out. I know you didn't, but but that I, was the right decision. I was gonna say I, I I agree with the decision. I think it's the right decision. Um, and I think the swing vote as you were kind of talking to John seemed to be that hey even if it's not raining and there's lightning in the area we have to shut all these things down yeah and who wants to go to O'Day without being blobbed nah it's just not you know it's not not jail blasters shooting up middle schools middle schoolers I tell you what you could have bought stock in the Cadillac and the hubcaps at that point because that would have been the main attraction up under the uh, oh yeah up under the gazebo they're selling CDs (laughs) who knows yeah selling CDs so anyway O'Day is not cancelled it is just postponed, and it is going to be happening now, Sunday, September 22nd. Same time, same place, 2 to 6 p.m., Camp Anderson Acre to Old Town, Florida, which, you know, that was the other side of things. We didn't want people to have to drive down to the river there at Old Town and then have to, like, not do anything. So, because, you know, depending on where you're coming from, it's honestly 45-minute hour drive. I've already heard... You know, uh, one, you know, very bougie friend of mine complained that it was too far away. Immediately, too. Like, uh, yeah, nice yeah. <laughs> super bougie. What he means is he's more addicted to fantasy football than I am, and he's watching it. Probably true. Um, But, you know, we want to make sure that it's going to be a good day, well worth your drive, well worth your time going down there, and it 100% is. So everything is still on, full go. The date time has changed, so mark that back on your calendars. Uh, September 22nd. 2 to 6 p.m. It's going to be a good time. Yeah, and remember what we just said about Mindshare. Like, it is impactful when you shoulder tap somebody and say, hey, we want you to come be a part of this with us. And I think one of the questions I got asked a bunch about O'Day, is this just for orchard people or can anybody come? And, like, I think this is a great front door for your friends who have been looking and searching. So, 100%. I invited uh, all the kids off of both of those teams that I coach. And we had some that were, like, coming. That's part of why I hated canceling it. It was like, wait, we we get to, like, go in the river and there's a pool and gel blasters and – there's guys we can play wiffle ball against, which, by the way, I'll be you and Matt to wiffle ball, maybe gamble too. Love it. Um, again, just to be clear, I did not obligate them to gamble. There's a friend named Cody Gamble yeah, plays yeah. guitar in our live oak location. Uh, I obligated him as well to yeah. play wiffle ball. Just throw that out there. Yeah, yeah. Gamble, uh, if he does play, I see him showing no mercy to the kids, regardless of their age group. And well, uh, there's a level of cutthroatness there that I can appreciate. I, I'm. Send it. Yeah. I'm here for it. I think it's also good for kids to get, like, absolutely beat down every once in a while. They need to be reminded. It's just a reality just, check. You know, hey, buddy, you, you ain't got that dog in you yet. Yeah. You're not that guy. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. You're, yep. you're not that, that guy. yiffy puppy out of here, big guy. Yeah, that's right. So that'll be good. I'm excited about that. Um, selfishly, I'm a little excited we did postpone it because now, I mean, that should be enough time removed. The whole family can come. So I'm selfishly glad that it got pushed back, but... Um, We're going to put Jensen on the blob? Absolutely <laughs> oh man but we can put dax on the blob do you think you can put dax on the know. blob i feel like you could uh, maybe i'm not the one to blob him but all right so who's gonna be able, who, who's gonna be there to catch him in the river that's now taking him down straight life jacket life jacket yeah they thought about you gotta catch it maybe we get with those big hooks you know like try. <laughs> decoy hook yeah just get the decoy hook. get dax that's good that'll be good i'm excited bark on your calendar invite a friend phenomenal front door and then Uh, I think a good segue to our actual meat of the conversation today is that we're going to be celebrating baptisms, and based on 24 hours ago, we're going to be celebrating more baptisms than we would have had if we did do it Sunday. Let's go. And I would love for you, Chip, to unpack a little bit of what Sunday looked like, but I want to peel the curtain back first, because if you come to the orchard and you're kind of still like in the the world of, I don't know why they do what they do, or I don't know what kind of informs some of those decisions, um, I would say that... These baptism Sundays are a phenomenal opportunity to peel the curtain back because we call them location pastor Sundays. In Ballantin's purposes, they are because it's a specific standalone message, yeah. but they're uniform on baptism Sundays and they're strategically and intentionally uniform. Um, and we say uniform, we mean they're like every other Sunday and that we plan those together. We walk through those together and we try to navigate that because 
um, we think that what God is doing at the orchard, he's doing at the orchard, not necessarily at Lake City or Live Oak or Brantford, but at the orchard as a whole. That's right. And so I think there's an element of the whole that is bigger than the sum of all of the pieces. Yeah, absolutely. And so when we do these baptism Sundays, we're having an intentional conversation and you're usually a pretty pointed guy. And Sunday I was actually ever heard that in my life. People say, Chip, you know what? Often you are just very subtle. Yeah. And I have to read between the lines with you a lot. So yeah. that's what I guess. Just unsure of where they stand. Yeah. And people yeah, just not yeah. sure where I stand. Do you have an opinion about anything? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's Chip in a nutshell. Just a big gray area guy. Um, <laughs> but I ended up doing the online Sunday. And so I got to listen to some of that. I wasn't here for recording Thursday, but I'm, I'm watching. Uh, and the reason I was doing online is because Nikki was taking a break and she needed a break. Shout out Nikki Griswold for being there every single Sunday online. She's a champ. She is. Every Sunday she hosts Facebook and we appreciate the heck out of that, Nikki. So um, I know that you, at least Jason will listen to this because he regularly has a conversation about the podcast. So Jason, if Nikki didn't listen to this one, tell her we appreciate her. Yeah. Um, clip a ton. Jason, clip it. Yeah. Tell her we appreciate her. But um, as I was listening to that, this may have been, dare I say, the most pointed I've ever heard you in a conversation from yeah. stage, and I do, and I think that's I, I, well. I don't. I have my opinions, but I would love to hear why was this such a big and important conversation for you Sunday? Because it seems like there was an extra level of zeal and pointedness, and I would love for you to just kind of walk walk through why this is such a big deal for you. Well, I think you know it goes back to conversation we had. A few weeks ago on the podcast about what makes a message, you know, transformative or whatever. And, and I think, you know, what makes some of these messages, let's just say special or, you know, uh, whatever, is timeliness and relevancy are a piece of that. And with us celebrating uh, a massive baptism, you know, we were looking at baptizing just who had signed up. 20, 25 people, you know, uh, on O-Day. And that may be conservative now that I'm thinking out loud. Anyway, you know, it, it was kind of relevant. That Let's go ahead and talk about this. Um, and then the timeliness of the relevancy is that, you know, it's something that we haven't explicitly talked about in a while. Uh, and so, okay, it's, it's timely too, because we need to hear this. Um, and, and then I think the reason that I was able to be so pointed with it is just that there's not a lack of clarity around what the application is yeah. for this. You know, like sometimes we, AJ, you appreciate this. We can struggle with what the application should be here and how specific do we want to get the application because, you know, if we, if we lean too hard into an application on one side, maybe that doesn't apply to somebody and, they, and they're left out. And so a lot of times what we say is, okay, let, let's be, you know, as specific as we can, but let's allow God to take that and apply it into each context of each person's life, how it needs to be. Well, with this one, I mean, I I don't think there was any, there, there was no option two or three for what the application is. The application was, if you have been saved and not baptized, you need to be baptized, yeah. you know? And I just don't think there was another option there. And so maybe that's why it was easy to be so pointed. Yeah. Um, I, and when I talk about the point in this specifically, um, I thought there was a ton of clarity around the conversation. But I, I think one of the points that you made specifically, maybe it was point number two, but it's that the method and the application, the timing are both very clear throughout yeah. Scripture. So I said I said it as the order and the method. Order and the method. The yeah. order and the method. The order of baptism as in it comes after salvation and the method of, sab- of baptism is. Uh, we believe to be immersion. Yeah. Right? And that's fancy word for dunking. Yeah. yeah. So I want to put you on the spot a little bit here. And I didn't preface this because it just popped in my head. But you, what would you say, and I think really and truly, if you were having those coffee conversations afterward, this is some of the stuff that would be asked. Yeah. Um, and I love that we have the podcast because we can navigate some of those or have those conversations. What would you say to the Presbyterian or the Methodist who is adamant that, you know, I was sprinkled as a kid, and that counts as baptism. How would you navigate that conversation with them? So number one, I would begin by showing grace, because one of the valid reasons that a believer is saved and not baptized is a misunderstanding. And there are people who are not convinced by Scripture or conscience that believer's baptism by immersion is biblical. Uh, at which point I would say we have to be obedient to Scripture and conscience. And so I would love to have that conversation to see if we can convince you of Scripture and by conscience. But if you're not convinced by Scripture and by conscience, then this isn't for you. There's still what I would say is 
from my perspective, a misunderstanding there. But from my perspective, it is a misunderstanding. Number one, because baptism inside of the New Testament is almost exclusively and explicitly, and I'll double click on that in just a second, for those who have repented of their sin and put their faith in Christ. It is almost that exclusively because the only possible exceptions that we see to that are, uh, number one, uh, people who have walked away from the faith who might have been baptized. And so we would say, okay, they might have made a profession of faith, but they never truly repented of their sin and were saved. So, you know, they did it because they thought they were or want others to think they were, but it wasn't real. Mm -hmm. Um, Number two is the explicitly part, almost without fail. In the over 80 times that uh, someone is baptized in the, you know, uh, in the New Testament, there is a baptism of repentance that happens under John's ministry before Jesus, the cross and the resurrection, yeah. which is a baptism of repentance by people who are repenting, mm-hmm. right, who knew were making that volitional choice. And then after the cross and the resurrection, there are people who are being baptized because they have volitionally repented and trusted Jesus. Yeah. Okay. So the what what precedes baptism in the New Testament, both under John and after Jesus, are acts of volition, intentional acts of the will, whereby repentance takes place. Mm-hmm. The reason I say almost exclusively and explicitly, we talked about exclusively, let me talk about explicitly, is because there are certain instances, and the one that jumps out in my mind is the Philippian jailer, where it says, you know, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved, you and all your household. And then it says, you and all your household, you know, they were baptized, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, and so I guess it doesn't explicitly say that the Philippian the family. jailer's family right. all prayed the prayer, quote unquote, um, but they were all baptized. However, it doesn't explicitly say that they didn't. Sure. It's taken it a, a step too far to say, oh, he baptized his kids because he got saved. No, I, I don't think right. that is not. While that may be a possible reading of the text, it is not a simple reading of the text. I think the clear example of the New Testament is that baptism follows an act of volition whereby an individual repents of sin. Yeah. And then now after the cross, trust in Jesus. So, so say, that's the order. Yeah, same with, would you say it's the same situation with Cornelius' household? Just yeah, the assumption yeah. there the, that... The household, that's right. Okay. A- anytime we read about the household being baptized, uh, again, it is not explicit that they all got saved and then were baptized, but on the same token, you can't argue that they got baptized because the head of the household was saved. Right, he doesn't cover the sins of the family, that's so right. to speak, right? That's right. Because the understanding from those who would say that we baptized, you know, infant, that is called paedo baptism, right? Mm-hmm. We baptize children, infants, is that baptism is a mark of the new covenant. And in the same way that in Israel, all children were circumcised as a mark of the old covenant, that now we are baptized as marks of the new covenant. And so if you are in a believing family, that's why you're baptized as a child. Um, I would disagree with that, and I think the passage we read in Romans chapter 6 is one of the main reasons that you disagree with that, because baptism is not a mark of the covenant in Paul's eyes in Romans chapter 6. It is a union with Christ. Yeah, It is a symbol of his death, burial, and resurrection. The only, to my knowledge, and and I, and I apologize if I'm speaking out of ignorance here, because like you sure, said, I put you on the spot, we didn't necessarily yeah. plan on this conversation. Um, the only denomination that I know of that baptizes for the forgiveness of sins, as in that is what gets you clean, um, is the Catholic Church. That baptism is for the forgiveness of your sin, uh, uh, to to wash away original sin. Yeah. uh, And their their christenings, the infant baptisms, um, and the Mormon Church. Yeah. It is you're baptized into the Mormon Church, which gets you into heaven. And that you can, and this is one of the disagreements that I have with the Mormon church, strong disagreement, is you can, as long as you know their name, can be baptized in place of anybody in your ancestral line who passed away, and that, and, and they can get into heaven too. Yes. Um, the Church of Christ has historically believed that baptism is necessary for salvation, but I don't think they would say it such as baptism washes away your sin and is what makes you forgiven. Yeah. Um, but they think that you can't separate the two. So right. uh, anyway, that's why I would say the order is important because baptism does not get away sin, uh, wash away sin. 
Uh, it's not a sign of the covenant. It is a union with Christ. Uh, and to be united with Christ, there has to be a profession of faith before that. Yeah. Yeah. And even to Paul's point, I think it's in Galatians, he gets onto them and he says, you who mutilate the flesh, right? And yeah. the point being like, it ain't that circumcision is not the covenant keeping moment. It is um, you have circumcised hearts and who have pursued and surrendered to Jesus, not just uh, with your flesh, but in spirit and in truth. And so, um, I don't know. I think that's, there's a lot of those little points throughout scripture that seem to affirm, um, hey, it's not the water that changes you, right? It's, yeah. I think when we try to proof text stuff like this, like find one verse that mm-hmm. says you must be saved before you are baptized, you're not, you're not going to find that or else there wouldn't be a plethora of interpretations around this. Sure. But I think if you, with an open mind and clear conscience, read the narrative of the New Testament, the overarching narrative of the New Testament is incredibly clear. Baptism is for believers. Yeah. The method of baptism is maybe a little bit more confusing for people. But again, it's because baptism is not explicitly stated as dunking. However, there are some very key key indicators that baptism is by immersion. Number one is the word baptize itself. Mm -hmm. The word baptizo in the Greek literally means to immerse. Yeah. Right? So that's very clear, very strong. Yeah. The other one is not the baptism of believers in the New Testament, but the baptism of Jesus. When Jesus is baptized by John, we have a Trinitarian moment. You have the Son submitting to obedience to the Father. In his obedience to the Father, there's a voice that comes from heaven that says, this is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, then descends on Jesus as a dove, right? In the shape of a dove. When does this happen? Go back and look at Mark's gospel. Coming up out of the water. Mm, Yeah. Right? So there's the insinuation. He went down into the water. There it is. Come out. There it is. And some have said, oh, that just means when he was walking out of the river. Okay, I guess that's plausible, but it doesn't seem likely. Right. The moment that this voice would have come from heaven and the dove would have come is more likely to have happened not 60 seconds after Jesus is done, but as the culmination of him rising up out of the water. And again, it, to me, even as I talked about Sunday, the, the other step that, that clarifies the method is, well, it's a picture. And what's it a picture of? It's a picture of death and resurrection. Mm-hmm. Okay, we don't sprinkle dirt or pour dirt on dead folks. Right. Th- they're buried. Yeah. And so th- I think that is kind of my, you know, how long was that? 10 minutes, yeah. this is the order, this is the method, this is the biblical support for both, yeah. even though there's not a verse that says, thou shalt dunk them. Yeah. I think it's also a good reminder, right? And I have this in the in the notes here, but I think sometimes we underestimate clarity, right? I, and I think that maybe one of the reasons Sunday was so impactful based on what I've heard and the feedback I've gotten is because it was incredibly clear and scripture was clear and we didn't shy away from that, right? Your Your conversation with everyone Sunday was very clear. And I think that they'll baptized. Yeah. Get baptized. Right. And I think you even said at one point, face it again, based on feedback I heard, I wasn't in, in service with you, but that you had full intentions of saying, go home, get your bathing suit. If this is you bring it to O'Day and let's not wait. Let's not, you know, why put this off when this is the clear command, you felt conviction, you felt the burden, you know, this is obedience. You know, and and there is an example of that in scripture as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The Ethiopian eunuch. Yeah. Acts chapter eight. There's water. What's stopping me from being baptized? Answer? Gosh dang. Nothing. That is one of my favorite stories because you, there's so much in it. But one of the things that I love about that story is this guy, he's got a divine appointment, and that's clear throughout that entire moment. And then after his divine appointment or during his divine appointment, he says, I get it. Like the veil is pulled back. My, I see like the eyes of my heart have been open. I'm all in on this Jesus guy. There's a next step. Help me go take the next step. I want to go take yeah. the next step. And and the reason I, I bring that up, and I'm glad you mentioned that passage, is because I think for Philip in the eunuch, there's clarity. And for you and the message Sunday, there was clarity. And so for you, the the person listening and your friends, there can be clarity. And, and you don't need to invite them to church so they can have this clear moment or this yeah. epiphany. Have the conversation it's clear. Walk through a clear conversation with them and don't underestimate what clarity can do. Yeah, absolutely. And I think maybe this is a a good time and a good format for us to be a little bit nuanced. If there are times when we are not clear on something 
in preaching on Sunday mornings. It is because we believe there is not that level of clarity from the scriptures. Sure. Uh, Let me give you a very practical example of that. We recently did a sermon series that went through the gifts of the Spirit inside of First Corinthians. And people were asking, when are you going to talk about tongues? When are you going to talk about tongues? When are you going to talk about tongues? And we did a little bit. But the answer was, man, I just don't believe there's a ton of clarity in the Scriptures for me to be able to tell you, this is what this is. Mm-hmm. And I take very seriously when I am explicit, bold, clear, and authoritative mm-hmm. in my preaching. Because I don't want to be clear about something I'm not clear about. Right. And I don't want to be clear about something I don't think Scripture is clear about. So I think, speaking for myself and the guys on staff at the Orchard, you are never going to hear us speak on God's behalf unless we are very, very certain that this is what we need to do because it's that clear in Scripture. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons I think what you see from us a lot of the times is we keep the main thing the main thing. And when we are clear, it's because it's very clear. And right. the tier one things stay top priority for us because we do think there's room. Even on staff, there's room for some certain things in the theological conversations. But when it comes to the things that are clear, when it comes to salvation, when it comes to the gospel, we're going to preach with conviction and we're going to yeah. preach clearly because it's clear. But otherwise, we're going to leave, I think, some room. Um, and we're going to give you our inferences. I mean, like you just said, one of the things you're never shy on is your opinion. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I don't mind sharing my opinion. Right. I'm just very careful or try to be that my opinions are not equated in people's mind with using some Old Testament King James, thus saith the Lord. Right. You know, because those are two very different things. Yeah. And I want to be clear that this is an opinion I have. I believe it's well thought out. I believe it's well researched. But I see the other side of it. Yeah. Thus saith the Lord is, no, I am thoroughly convinced by Scripture and by conscience that th- it is this clear. Yeah. 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 And I think that's a good thing to, uh, to get to that point because if we, and we were having this conversation about a episode we may be recording this week later, but if you can get the main thing to be the main thing and you can understand that, what it starts to do is it starts to help you inform everything else, right? And so we can draw good conclusions and we can draw good inferences because we understand uh, a lot of different things. One, the heart of God. This is the same God who's laid out the gospel for us. Two, what are his intentions, generally speaking? Three, uh, how does he want me to navigate this, generally speaking? And so I think there's some things that about the main thing being the main thing that help us infer about other things a lot of the times. But I also think that, uh, and and I think this is tricky, and this is where People may not understand, may not get, but there's a weightiness to the pastoral role and title because yeah. you are judged with a greater strictness and you are the one who's held accountable to that flock of sheep. And and that's that's something you want to get right. That's yeah, something absolutely. you don't want to misstep on. Which is why, and we've had this conversation on the podcast, we've had a hundred times this conversation outside of the podcast. It is why I think pastors specifically need to be so careful saying, God told me, Mm -hmm. God told me, Mm -hmm. God told me, you know, and and I I think that when we say that, like, number one, we better not be wrong, right? And then number two, if we say that and our people are truly reverent to the word of the Lord, then we just cut down any disagreement by them saying, oh, well, I mean, I guess if God said, you know, and then where are we at? And I don't believe that's how the church is designed to be, where it's like the pastor saying, I'm speaking on behalf of God. No, we believe that every believer, not just pastors, has direct access to the Father, has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and can, for themselves, by the illumination of that Spirit, interpret the Word. Right. And so, I'm not saying there's never times where I don't say, I think the Lord is telling me. I think the Lord is showing me. But to say it in such a way that, hey, this is it, thus saith the Lord— I mean, there's only a few things that I'm going to pull that on, uh, and I'm going to be very certain about those. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's a good thing. Um, And full circle, baptism is one. Yeah, baptism is one of those things that is clear. And So all that to say, circling all the way back to that, the beginning of that conversation, the point of it is this is one of those things you can be clear on. The gospel is one of those things you can be clear on. And what I would encourage you to do, you, the listener, um, is take the next step on holding on to clarity and sharing clarity with the people in your lives. And don't wait for the moment where you have to say, 
hey, let me bring you over here so this guy can tell you. And that's not a bad thing to invite your friends to church. It's a good thing to invite your friends to church. For sure. But don't do it behind the guise of, I don't feel um, like I'm adequate and I need some piece of the clergy to share this information. If it's clear and it's like things like baptism, the gospel, and, and they're explicitly there, have the conversation step into it because I think there's a lot of really cool moments that you can um, see are not just for the pastor, but they're for you. And God wants to use you. God wants to use, That's right. air quote, the average Joe to step in and do incredible things. And yeah, the power of the church is not the clergy. The pa- so, so the power of the church is the pew. Yeah, the people who are sitting there. That's right. that's the power of the church. You know, I think uh, on the other side uh, of that, you know, it, it's important, you know, for me to to, you know, encourage people. Okay, the fact that is that it is this clear is also why it's this important. And really, the so what of the message ended in get baptized. Yeah, but the reason behind that was. Because baptism is that foundational act of obedience in the life of a believer. Right. You know, because, and I put it like this, and this again is Chip's thinking sure. on the subject. But how can I expect to live a life of obedience in often very gray, very unclear, very difficult situations? How can I expect to be obedient there Yeah. when I deliberately choose to be disobedient in something that is clear, simple, and easy. Yeah. And that's just an issue for me, right? Because it's like, I I just, I I don't, I don't understand that, you know? So I'm interested. Do you you have some thoughts on that? Yeah. I I mean, I think that's a phenomenal perspective. And I think it's, it's the, he who's faithful with little can be faithful with much idea. And you see that echoed by Jesus through the parables and you see this understanding like man I've given you access to the kingdom I've given you access to share the kingdom with people go and do it because if you can get to the point and and you see this like when I say this you're going to have like 10-15 names that pop into your head immediately but you see the people who are like man this is incredible I need other people in on this and they live their life in a way that's like every opportunity I get to be clear with the gospel I'm going to take advantage of and what you see from those people is you see it's not just that area of their life that God's in on. It's every area of their life. You, you see these people and you're like, these are these are people that I would look up to and I would want my faith to be like their faith. And I think one of the reasons we look up to those people and one of the reasons we identify those people as really spiritual people that love Jesus, especially spiritual people in air quotes, is because you see that Jesus is all over their life. And I think that Jesus is all over their life because they've been able to be faithful with a little bit. And when they're faithful with a little bit, God says, okay, here's some more, here's some more, here's some more, here's some more, here's some more. And they're just like, it's, Chip, when I'm faithful with a little bit, my life is incredible. It's incredible to see what Jesus does with people. So so I want to keep doing that. And then Jesus says, okay, well, here's a little bit more to be faithful with. And they're like, oh my gosh, I have another story about how I was faithful again. And then their lives become consumed by and saturated in little moments of faithfulness day by day by day by day and hour by hour. And you look up one day and you're like, man, this guy... Is Jesus is all over his life, and I think one of the reasons we think that about people and we see that about people is because he is, for one, and he is because they've proven they can be faithful with little. Yeah, I think a very interesting, like, non-church connecting point to this whole idea of, like, foundational obedience. Um, so if I, if I say this, AJ, you know what I'm talking about, make your bed. Make your bed, the guy, the Marine, right? Yeah, his, General William McRaven, yeah. right? So he gave a uh, graduation speech, uh, I think it was at the University of Texas, and it was just make your bed. And the point was, you need to start each day with an accomplishment. Mm-hmm. Start each day getting something done. Be disciplined to make your bed, and then that's going to help you be disciplined in all of your life to be, accomplish things. And it, it took the internet by storm, yeah. right? Like Mind just blown. Every it's so like, simple, yeah, it's it's so just really, like, I don't know how many people have told me, you know, make your bed, make your bed, make your bed. Uh, I don't make my bed every morning. I was going to say, I'm cooked. I, I, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I do. Uh, sometimes I, I don't. But the point is, man, what is that principle? Oh, it's foundational obedience, mm-hmm. right? So what we're saying is, if you start your journey of following Jesus with this foundational act of obedience, then just like, quote, making your bed, it's going to set a pattern of your life that you can then follow to success. Yeah. Yeah. And I've heard you say this to people about baptism a bunch is like, hey, because one of the questions we get asked is I or talked about is I, I don't know how to hear from the Lord or I don't know what the Lord wants me to do. And 
And one of your biggest pieces of advice is, well, when was the last time you heard him clearly? Go back to there. Were you obedient or were you disobedient? You know, were you obedient with the thing that you know for sure he called you to? And I think baptism is that for a lot of people. Yeah, I think that I want to be hesitant to say if you've never been baptized and you know you should have, then you're not going to hear from the Lord in any other area of your life. Yeah. I, I don't want to go that far. Yeah. But I 100 percent believe that I'll say it this way, that our growth and relationship with Jesus is going to be stunted when there is an area of known disobedience that we refuse to address. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think that is the most nuanced like way I can say it. That that is that is the my tickling ears way of saying that. This doesn't tickle many ears. Yeah. If you know you've got disobedience in your life in this area, not because you're unclear about it, you're confused, you've never had a chance. It's just the whole, yeah, I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want to. I don't like getting up in front of people. What would people I I, I don't want to. Then man, I'm not saying that you don't have a relationship with Jesus or there can't be some good things there, but it ain't gonna be it, it, it ain't going to be what you need it to be. It ain't going to be what you want it to be. And so I think that's, that's a big issue. Yeah. There's a, and I, and I maybe even would have disagreed with this in some ways, just in my, my pride and my hubris um, in college, but there's a, a statement and I, I said it at the end of the service a couple Sundays ago, but our psych professor used to say it at the beginning of every class, at the end of every class and maybe 14 times during every class. But he used to say, get it right. You'll be blessed get it wrong, you'll be hurt. And I think that principle is wrapped up in what we're saying. If you would get it right, if you would just step into obedience, you'll see the blessings, not just for you, but the people around you. And if you get it wrong, you're going to see a lot of pain in the disobedience and and what sin does with the disobedient person. Yeah. So I want to dig into that a little bit because I want to push back on that very slightly Yeah. in the sense that I think there's a way we can mishear what you just said. I think it's worth bringing clarity to for sure. And what I mean by that is get it right, you'll be blessed. Okay. I think some people hear that and they're like, oh, that's why everything's going wrong in my life. Sure. Right. That's why I'm suffering. That's why I'm broke. That's why I, you know, uh, you know, whatever car broke down this week. That That's not what that means. Blessing is in the obedience itself. Sure. When yeah. we are obedient to Jesus, getting Jesus is the blessing. Yes. A fulfilled relationship with Jesus is what we're going for. Mm-hmm. That's the reward. Yes. The dot being obedient, the disobedient is the hindering, the the sever, not severing, the the stunting of that relationship. Yeah. And so I want to be clear, we say that like, you know, you're, you're thinking, gosh, I got so much credit card debt, I need to get baptized. Right. No, that's not, that. that's not the principle at play here. And it that's not to say that when we are obedient to Jesus, that he does not design a life that is flourishing. Sure. But that's not the point. Yeah. Because if that's the point of your obedience, you're using Jesus as a tool. I would even go as far to say, if that's the point of your obedience, then you're missing it because you're going to find yourself not fulfilled. Um, in chasing after a blessing like that, you're going to find yourself empty. And for the believer who understands blessing in the sense of blessing like we just talked about, like you just unpacked, they're going to find the truth in Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. The desires of your heart, if you're delighting in Jesus, um, are probably going to be more of Jesus. And so your fulfillment is going to come with Jesus when other people come to Jesus, when you encounter Jesus, when you experience him, and everybody around you does too. And so, yeah, when when we say get it right, you'll be blessed, you're going to want more of what that relationship with Jesus looks like, um, not a million dollar 401k or not a new Ferrari or jet. That's the word blessed can get so hijacked that it says, and it has. Like, let's lean into that just a minute. But I, I would say this, if you are being obedient, only that you would get the blessing, you're not being obedient, you're being manipulative. Sure, yeah. Obedience and manipulation are not the same. Jesus becomes a means to an end. And if he's not the end, then you have missed it entirely. That is That is correct. That's good, man. Um, anything else you would add on baptism before we kind of move on? I know we have. I want to. I want to talk to you a second about the next series, and then we have a question that came in uh, via the podcast submission this past week. Anything else? Um, you know, I just think again, if you're hearing this, let's be clear. If you have been saved and not baptized since you've been saved, we really think you need to get baptized by immersion. I just think that that's that's very important um, because of everything that we've said. But just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy. Yeah. I'm not saying this is an easy decision to make. No. I'm just saying it's a simple decision for you to make. And I encourage you to do it. Yeah. Do not misconstrue clear and simple with easy. Um, Sometimes one of the hardest things you can do is be obedient and um, 
even though it's difficult, I think you'll find it's fulfilling. Um, so let me ask you this as we kind of pivot off of Baptism Sunday, but we don't leave it because it'll show back up on the 22nd at O'Day, which I'm fired up about. Um, okay. Let me let me say this too real quick while we're here. If that's you and you didn't get to fill out a card Sunday or you didn't get to fill one out online, but you were desperately in that category and it's set in with you for 24 hours now or 48 hours, you're like, you know what? I've been putting this off. I've been fighting it, but the Lord's winning my heart. I need to do this. Please reach out to your location pastor. You can submit a card online um, and that'll kick over to us and we can have that conversation. And we have now two weeks to get together and unpack some of that conversation to walk you through that, to make sure um, what's been made clear is abundantly clear before we step into the 22nd, but we don't want to be the reason that's hindered. And so we want to make sure it's as available as it could possibly be. So reach out to us uh, via that connect card online um, and let's walk through that conversation. Let's get coffee, lunch, yeah. or whatever. I, I think, let me just, you know, parentheses commercial for just a second. I had somebody tell me this week, one of the things they love about the orchard is that the pastors and staff are accessible and I told him, I said, man, that's one of the things I love about the orchard too. Mm-hmm. And when I say that, like, as the church continues to grow, it's impossible for us as a staff to know every single person. Yeah. It really is. You know, even if we want to, it just, it can't happen. However, we are structured in such a way, and multi side is a big part of that, that there's nobody who would walk in our door for the very first time who could not, by the end of the day, connect with one of our pastors Mm -hmm. like and i love that about our church because honestly when everybody shows up on the same sunday we're not a small church no we're not even really a medium-sized church anymore like a thousand plus is a large church Mm -hmm. but yet you can be connected to a pastor you know know them see their face you know know who they are they know and i do love that about our church so what you're saying spot on aj all you gotta do is reach out yeah all you gotta do is reach out it's that simple 100 percent 100%. 100%. So what's next for us, Chip? What's our next series? What's that look like? We got a handle on that. We got an idea of which direction we're going to go. Anything of that nature? Yeah, I think that, that there's a couple that are in my head right now because we got two series that are coming in quick order. Uh, the first one is going to be a series called Transformed, where we are really just going to be looking at the idea of what it means to be converted. We don't use that language yeah. much anymore, right? The idea of conversion, somebody being converted. If we do, it does not have Christian implications on it, okay. right? It also has that manipula- manipulative connotation, does, I think, in our culture. It? Like, it does. Um, you know, converted is not necessarily a positive word, and yet conversion is what happens when we get saved. Mm-hmm. And so there's a question uh, in the Heidelberg Catechism. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah, I read through the Heidelberg Catechism all the time. time. Yeah, yeah, super familiar. Well, catechisms are a question and answer format where, you know, they would teach kids doctrine of the faith by throwing out a question um, scripted, right? You know, for instance, the question I'm about to share with you is Heidelberg Catechism question 88. It's this question. The kid memorizes the question, and then they memorize the answer. And so that seems like super simple, and yet, what it does is, as they understand the answer, because they memorize it and have conversation about it, it teaches them theology. And we don't really do that anymore. Most Baptistic traditions have never really done that, but church history, they've been around forever. Yeah. So, all that say, Heidelberg Catechism, question 88. Here's the question. In how many things does true repentance or conversion consist? Answer, in two things. The dying of the old man and the making alive of the new. Mm. I love that. That's good. And that's really what this next series is going to be about. What What is conversion? What does that look like? And it's really two things. It's the dying of the old man and the making alive of the new. And it's going to be a short series, three weeks. And we're going to be looking at, again, I know we love this, some narrative scriptures, uh, primarily Gospels, Acts, you know, looking at, at that. And I think that's going to be that's going to be fun. That's going to be one of AJ's, like, he yeah. loves the narrative series like that. I do. I really do. I love that. Um, and I think the reason I love that is because you get to, like, you move from the hypothetical to, like, okay, what did Stephen do? Like, here was the charge. Here was the command. How did Stephen do that? Okay, here's what it looks like to be a Christian. How did Philip do that? You know what I mean? It's like, all right, why are we overcomplicating and theorizing yeah. what these people lived? Well, so, like, I mean, really, you know, when you get down to that, I think that probably means to be like Philip, you should start walking to Jacksonville. And when you see a broke down car, knock yourself out. Yeah, only if told. Um, <laughs> so, so that's good. I'm excited about that. And then uh, we didn't get to a nerd out section today, so maybe we'll do it here with the question. I'll give Chris the moment to pause dramatically.
Boom, there it is. Okay, here's the question we had submitted. What Bible do you preach out of? And I would say, let's add to this question and say, why do you preach out of that Bible? Why do we do that? Um, I preach out of my Bible because it'd probably be weird to take somebody else's. Come on. Um, No, so uh, obviously we're talking about translations here uh, is what the question is about. And uh, at the Orchard, uh, all of our pastors preach out of the Christian Standard Bible, the CSB. Uh, it is a newer translation. Matter of fact, let's, let me let me Google that real quick since the doucher is out. But uh, the CSB is a newer translation. We can leave some of that do, 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 while you're looking. Or, or why did he need to? You just yeah. you just did that yourself. Sure. Yeah. Um, Maybe you just clip that and we'll use it in the future. <laughs> never know. But the CSB is a translation that is a revision. And I don't think they say exactly it's a revision. They say it's a successor of, as in they didn't necessarily start with the one and make the new one. They started all over again. But it is a successor of the Holman Christian Standard Mm. Bible put out by Holman Publishers. Uh, The CSB came out in 2017. I just looked it up. 2017. Um, We're relevant. Yeah. And and so I'll be honest with you, like just completely honest, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, the HCSB, Got the name, the nickname, the Hardcore Southern Baptist Bible. Hardcore Southern Baptist. Because it was published, and I don't know if this ever been fully acknowledged. It's kind of like understood. Mm -hmm. It was published by Lifeway and Holman Publishers because they did not have to pay to use that translation in their curriculum. The King James Bible is the most famous public domain Bible that's out there, which means that anybody can use it, quote it, print it. If you have, you can print your own King James Bible to sell them, AJ. Really? Um, the But like the, the NIV, let's say, is published by Zondervan. And when the Lifeway curriculum would use the NIV, they would have to pay for use of that. Hmm. So the HCSB, well, they owned it. They didn't have to pay for it. Now, here's the thing. Do I think that's a great reason to make a new Bible translation? No, I don't. But the CSB, the one that we preach out of now, in my opinion, is a fantastic Bible translation. Yeah. And, and, and that's why we use it. And, and, and here's, here's the why behind it. The CSB is a very literal translation in the sense that it tries to translate the Bible word for word as much as possible. Mm. You know what? Let's do something that we have never done on this podcast before. Let's have a nerd out segment in the middle of our nerd out segment. Double nerd, Chris. Okay, so so here's the thing. When you look at Bible translation, there is a scale. On one side of that scale is what we call formal equivalence. Mm -hmm. Formal equivalence is literal, word for word. Here's the word in Greek. Or Hebrew, we're going to translate that word to English. Yep. Dynamic equivalence is not word for word. It is thought for thought. Okay, okay, let me read that, and then let me then translate it how we would say it in our language. Right. Um, let me tell you the problem with going too far on either end of that spectrum. Yeah. If you go too far on the dynamic thought for thought side, you don't end up with a translation. You end up with a paraphrase. Right. Right. Which it's just like, oh, I'm just paraphrasing this. Right. And we know that paraphrasing is not the same as translating. Or yeah, and, you, and you miss a lot of those subtle things that are intended. Yeah, especially because it's an inspired book. Right. Word for word, it's an inspired book. So yeah. paraphrase does lose some of that. I am a believer, and feel free to disagree with me. Email us, let us know on the podcast. <laughs> Paraphrases aren't inspired. They're somebody else's word of an inspired word. Yeah. Right? Which, yeah, even though not inspired can be helpful oh, yeah. when trying helpful. to understand. I, mean, I, use, I use paraphrases. Yeah. I don't think I would ever preach out of a paraphrase. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, on the other side, say, well, that's why that's why I'm a very literal word for word. Right. There is not a formal equivalence translation that is a truly formal equivalence because the syntax and syntax structure of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek is so yeah. far from English, you couldn't read it wouldn't be an a, English It wouldn't be a comprehensive thought by the end of that That's sentence. right. It would not be a word-for-word word translation. And so that's why I say Bible translation is a scale. Mm-hmm. On one side, you have formal equivalence. On one side, you have dynamic yeah. equivalence. Okay? So, so let's just look at some very popular translations that are out there. Very far on the formal equivalent side would be something like the New American Standard Bible. Sure. It's a very 
modern English translation, but at a very high reading level yeah. because of the, the syntax involved. On the dynamic side of the equation would be something that's, you know, I think it's a good translation, would be the New Living Translation. Mm-hmm. It is very much a thought-for-thought thought translation. And here's why I think that's helpful, because you say, well, why would you even want that? Well, because when you read 200 denarii in your scripture, do you know what that means? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have to right. go look that up, what that means. Well, in, in a dynamic equivalent translation, they go ahead and do that for you. Yeah. They just translate it into what the English wage would be. Right. Um, and, you know, and so in the middle... Uh, of that, uh, closest to the middle, has probably always been the NIV. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of the more recent updates to the NIV have pushed it more to the dynamic equivalent side of the equation. Right. And so for me, the CSB is the new translation that's in the middle leans formal. Yeah, easy to read. We're not missing a lot of what's intended, but not quite a paraphrase. I think if I remember right, it's like an eighth grade reading level, so it's not a super hard reading level. Um, It is. Some people just had a moment right there. Gosh, dang. That's way harder (laughs) than it should be. All right, Um, uh, You know, so it's it's a good translation. It's modern English. But here is why we switched at the orchard. Because in my opinion, the second best translation out there is a little bit more on the formal side, and it's the ESV, right? the English Standard Version. The Reformed Bible chip. Well, you know, some people would say, uh, I'm not sure it is anymore, but yeah. some people would say, right. uh, the ESV. Um, and it's a little bit higher reading level. Mm-hmm. But here is why we switched at the orchard from the ESV to the CSB. Like it, love it, hate it. Here's the answer. Because the CSB reads more like people speak Mm -hmm. the esv reads more like people write yeah i don't know if that makes sense to you but if it doesn't go write an email write a a text write a letter and then go say that same thing in a conversation to someone else yeah it's going to sound completely different just the the vernacular the flow of the conversation it's just as different and so when it came to preaching the scriptures we felt like the esv was a phenomenal translation but the CSB was too. Yeah. We felt like the CSB was just as faithful to the original text as the ESV, but it was easier to preach from because of the way it was translated. Yeah. And so that is why we use the CSB. Yeah. My hermeneutic class in college, I had to write a paper and it had to be over 60 pages. It ended up being 68. Um, and I'm proud of this paper because I wrote it in 36 hours. But I had to take five translations um, and break them down. Uh, like So I had to take a section of Scripture, had to be uh, no less than 10 verses, no more than 15. I picked 11, Romans 10. Um, and you had to walk through them with every single one of your translations, and you had to navigate and identify the differences, the implications of the differences, so on and so forth. And uh, you mentioned several of the ones I used. I used... Uh, the NASB, the NAS, NASB, whatever. I used the HCSB at that time because the CSB wasn't out yet. Uh, or Southern Baptist. Yeah, I used the C, uh, the ESV um, as well. I used the NIV, and then my fifth one was the NKJV. And when you start to look at chunks of Scripture, uh, some are going to be more you know different than others. They're going to have bigger dis- the disagreements or whatever um, with the publishers and the decisions they make because, fun fact— um, Every single one of these Bibles has a team of Greek and Hebrew scholars that are getting in the room and saying, hey, here's why we think this is what this says. And so it's not a bunch of idiots making these decisions. It's a bunch of very intelligent individuals who are getting in the room and coming up with their publications. But it's interesting to be able to look at those different translations and see why, oh, I I see why they decide to make it say this instead of this, because this Greek word is used 15 times over here, but only twice over here. And so it could mean this or that. But yeah, um, and that's funny, you know, instead of going to a full third nerd out section nerd, outside of yeah. this inception, layer upon layer upon layer, the way that we translate a lot of those words can vary based on how the author of Scripture uses them, because John doesn't use a word the same way Paul does exactly, yeah, you know, and right. so it may be used a, a little bit, you know, when when I say lit, it may not mean the same thing AJ means when he says lit, which is probably not the same thing that the guy down at the local bar says when he means lit. Yeah, that's so, true. Th- yeah. That, that's kind of the point there. Right, yeah, which is fun. That's good. Um, and a, there's a lot more of that conversation that could be had, but I think we've heard it. Like about the lit or the translation? Uh, yes, all the um, okay, see. Um, but we've nerded out quite a bit, and that's kind of a good way to round out, I think, um, with that conversation. We always find a way to fill people's time. <laughs> yeah. Some yeah. of that stuff, um, so. Maybe, you know, sometimes 
we feel it too much and they cut us off. Who knows? Yeah. We don't know. Or yeah. they fast forward it until they get to the part they want to hear. I don't know. But we are thankful that you guys listen to this and bring it all the way back to the beginning, you know, sharing it or, or even this, just, just sharing the link with something that you found helpful in the podcast is, mm-hmm. is very uh, much a big deal. Um, same with messages, whatever. So we appreciate that. Here's how much of an American I am. I opened my computer up to go find that paper. And it occurred to me that when I did my last purge to make sure I had more storage on my computer, I deleted like a lot of those college documents and it was in one of those documents. So all right, Pete, all that hard work, I'll never see it again. Yeah. You know what? We're passing tests and yep. getting degrees. That's right. That's what it's all about, baby. <laughs> Pass the test. All right. Uh, well, we will catch you guys. Right, last thing. Go. Jets, Niners. Monday Night Football. Oh, hey, devastating. Yeah. I don't know. Here's the thing with the Jets defense. Everybody's gassing them. Okay, that's too much. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for this episode of Let's Talk About That. We hope it encouraged and challenged you as we continue to grow in this journey of faith and embrace community. If you have more questions, thoughts, or feedback, we'd love to hear from you. Reach out to us through our social media channels or visit our website and stay connected. Your questions are what make this podcast a dynamic and enriching experience. If you found today's discussion meaningful, don't forget to subscribe, share, and leave a review. Your engagement helps us spread the message and connect with others who may find value in these conversations. Until next time, we hope this episode inspired you and will help you bring Sunday's message into your week ahead. Keep the conversation alive, and remember, we're all on this journey together.